Abby, can you tell us the history of the area? I will. I'll go back to way back into the beginning of Christianity. The road you come into my place here is known as Bohar Dunfo Padrick. It's the road of the brown cow belonged to Patrick is the translation. So when he uh, Christianized King Angus in Cashin, he then took it upon himself to travel south and he was to head straight down to Ardmore in the county Waterford. And this road outside is in a direct line with Ardmore and Cashin. In the earlier times, it didn't zigzag over in Heather at all. It was like the Romans done, a dead straight line. And it went down from Cashel through here, through Ardfinnan, which Ardfinnan wasn't mentioned as Ardfinnan then. He crossed the river there. And then he hit for the Knockmill Down Mountains. And he went straight over him into Ardmore. But the story goes about his cow. You see, he wouldn't have travelled on his own at all. There'd be quite a lot of people with him that he would have brought for uh, to accompany him for even cooking and food for him. And they brought sheep with them and cattle with them for and cows for to be milked for to have the milk. So his cow travelled down with them to Gorton Bridge, if you ever heard of the place. They called it Bally Bacon in them days, but the very precise spot is Gorton Bridge, they say. So the cow calved overnight there. And when they got up in the morning, the cow's calf was stolen. And the cow, not knowing any better where to find the calf, ran all the way back up to Cashel. So she gives her name to the road outside there, Bohardon for Patrick. So St. Patrick got his calf back and his cow, and he went into Ardmore, where there was a Christian community there before his arrival. Now, so how did Cromwell influence the area? Well, Cromwell came into County Tipperary and he crossed the River Shore at Rochestown, down near Ardfinnan, and he turned for care. And he sat outside the castle in care for a few days and gave him an ultimation to surrender. And they surrendered. And he left Cair, and do you see that hill below there, Knocker Hill it's known as. Mm -hmm. He travelled to Feathert, this side of Knocker Hill, and his old gun carriage was getting sunk as he travelled over along to Feathert in what is known as the Black Bog over the way. And it took him a week to do the journey of the 15 miles. But in the meantime, he let loose his son-in-law, who was Irington was his name. And he went to Cashel and burned the rock of Cashel. And then he turned around and hit every castle or tower house that was around, that were left standing around here, because there was a, a heavy war before that in what is known as the Desmond Wars. So quite a few of them were already knocked down. And when they'd done a settlement for Cromwell's soldiers after Cromwell departed Yahal for 
England again. He left a skeleton staff around the country, especially in Kilkenny, Tipperary and Cork, and the Midlands up along, and a division of the lands took place. And Martelstown Castle Coyne area was given to a fellow by the name of James Beeks. And Cadre, which is over the way here, two miles, was given to his brother Willem Beeks. They were two Cromelian soldiers of um, a fortune, or if you like, uh, th they were out for to get a w rewarded for their services in in a good sized landmass. So they got these places, and they didn't stay for long. They let it to tenants, and they brought over the tenants for it from England. And I still have the tenants' names, who they were, what were their names. And uh, I would have to look up that now, because they were all English names. And they stayed there in around this part for the next about a hundred years. And then they simply died out, and their names are not recorded any further around the place. So that was Cromwell's influence in this place. But I suppose I should have, in a sense looking back, brought you through the Desmond Wars, because there was a big battle fought up the road here mm. in the Desmond Wars. Now. Could you tell us about the H School? I will. Over the road here again, uh, beyond the graveyard, is a small plot of ground and is known as Park na Lauer. And a Kerry man in my great grandfather's time taught school by the side of the ditch over there. And he got paid some small fee by the people that could afford it. He got a couple of pence per pupil. He wouldn't have maybe got a shilling a week or two, I don't know, but his job anyway was to teach him Irish and arithmetic, and strangely enough, English. They were anxious to learn English or to help him to immigrate, because America spoke English, so they wanted a knowledge of English. And when that school there then went on for several years, they built a new school down the road this way, and the new school got a fella in it was a roof building of thatch. The ruins of it are still there. Uh, and you'll be going down that mm -hmm. way to Cair. Mm -hmm. Watch out very careful. You'll go to uh well let's see now. You'll come a the first thing you'll do now is you'll pass one house two story on your right hand side going down, the next one, and there's a boreen going down by the side of the next one. And then you've got a farmyard, you keep coming along and you meet an old two story house. And pass off the old two story house and there's a whole load of laurels you know what laurels yes. are, mm -hmm. coming onto the side of the road. Well, that was the site of the first building of a school in this area. And the schoolmaster, and he had a schoolmistress at this time, got instructions, and I don't know who gave them to him, whether they were what was known as the commissioners or who they were, but 
in it, every pupil going to school got a stick of about that length and a twine tied to the top of it and they put it on over their head and it went down along the front of that dress or jersey or whatever they would have. And if any one of them spoke a word of English during the day, or the word of Irish during the day at school, the master would put a mark of a penknife on it, on the stick. It was known as the butter. Now, before they left to go home in the evening, he would examine each one of them, and if you had four marks on it, you got four slaps of a cane. If you had ten, you got ten. And the children strove very hard to have no marks, and that's how the English language got spoken by the people around here. And by 1870s, the Irish language was nearly gone. Only the older people had the language in 1870. All the young people were speaking English from then on. Now, his, uh, his uh, female teacher and himself had a bit of a row. And she decided that she'd go and start up her own school. And she was married up the road and her descendants are still here, they're O'Briens. And in one of the, the little outhouses they had, she tidied it up and <coughs> she taught school there. And a lot of the students left the other school and she taught them from there on. Now, in 1901, Lady M Margaret Charters of Care, who was a butler, decided that she'd build a school for her tenants. Remember me telling you back along the boundary between butlers on the south side and the uh, rest of us up here, which weren't in the, the care, it weren't in the estates of butlers. She'd build a schoolhouse for their education and she put up Ballon Gary School in 1901 and she built Gary Clahar as well. Mm -hmm. And she, she uh, uh, got the school that was uh, attached to St Paul's to take Catholic pupils as well as the Protestants. So that brings you up to that school and the government took it over then. That was the the British government were in charge at the time. And then when we won the, the, the state, we we'll say the first of the free state, the government of education took it over. So that school is still there. Now, that's as far as 